we're just a few days away from Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender finally being unleashed into the world. And while plenty of other channels have already thrown their two cents in, and will do so after it releases, as one of the channels dedicated to animation, I just couldn't keep my mouth shut until Thursday. You may not believe this if you follow me on Twitter, but I actually want this show to be good. I think most Avatar fans do. Because not only does no one want to relive the trauma that was M. Night's live-action movie, but a beloved franchise getting more exposure and gaining new fans is generally a good thing, contrary to what the gatekeepers say. Especially when said franchise has a whole-ass production company dedicated to creating new installments. You know how expensive that is? I don't want the Netflix remake to flop and Nickelodeon decides to call it quits altogether. I want it to be a hit and it gets new fans who were all like, uh, cartoons are for babies, to get hooked and go watch the original and love it, and then go watch Korra and fight about it online, and then probably get into anime and then the 2020 weeaboom happens all over again. But sadly, you can't always get what you want. It's evident that the real problem with Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender is isn't the Fire Ember player tier casting, or them reworking the story to accommodate the actors aging in between seasons, or the bending looking like… that? The real problem is that the showrunners seem to love The Last Airbender, yet are embarrassed by its roots at the same time. Like they're only infatuated with parts of the show. The lore, the spectacle, the darker moments. You know, hearts that made kids feel badass for watching a show that was airing on Nickelodeon. You see, I think they're hyper aware of season 1's reputation of being the season that feels the most like a kid show, and as a result, they're making the wrong decisions when it comes to course correcting. Wanting the whole thing to feel like season 3 from the jump, failing to understand that the Toad and characters only work because it was a gradual shift. You need to start at a group of flawed children who are in over their heads going on lighthearted adventures in order to get to the group of seasoned warriors who actually have a shot at ending the war. And I mean, they pretty much admit to this in the interview. You know, the one everyone's been ducking on. I think the essential tightrope that we had to walk is figuring out totally where this show lived. Because you wanted to stay true to the original, which already had a large component of humor, lots of action, lots of darkness too. This show, even as a Nickelodeon show, went pretty far in terms of mature themes and scenes. Things that you didn't see before. I mean, I think Ko the Face Stealer initiated nightmares in an entire generation of kids. That's not something you normally see on a Nickelodeon show. Speak for yourself, bro didn't see Angela Anaconda. I had a nightmare once she was like running around my city and turning everyone I knew and loved into like black and white versions of themselves. Shit was fucked. And as the series went on, seasons 2 and 3 are a lot more mature in theme than say, season 1 was. So for us, it was about striking the right balance of making sure you were true to the DNA of the original. But at the same time, we had to make it a serialized Netflix drama, which meant it couldn't just be for kids. I'd argue in addition to the humor and action, the original was also a serialized drama, at least more than other Nickelodeon shows at the time. I mean, every episode literally started with PREVIOUSLY. On on Avatar. Avatar. So again, it feels like they only want to embrace certain parts of the show. It also had to appeal to the people who are big fans of Game of Thrones. And so, it had to feel grounded and mature, and adult in that way too. So that's, like I said, the tightrope we had to walk. It's crazy to me that they point out that humor was a large part of the show, and that's something they think won't be appealing to all ages. Because I felt like a part of the reason they chose to remake Avatar was so that they could have a new flagship show to replace Stranger Things. Something that attracts viewers of all ages due to the cast being a mix of children and adults. And while younger viewers could relate to those middle school antics, the older viewers could be invested in characters like Steve, Nancy, Hopper, or Joyce. And that show is funny! Are we going to act like Eleven's obsession of Eggos wasn't a thing? I think I could still find the Stranger Things logo in a box. Dustin, Steve, and Hopper have all been a huge source of comedic relief throughout the show's run, but they also have moments where they lock in and take shit seriously. Yes, there's dark, gritty elements that keep viewers on the edge of their seats, and for some viewers, justifies their continued investment in the show that really is about the kids first and foremost, alongside things like 80s nostalgia, which really is gonna land for the adults watching at home. I think Avatar naturally checks off a lot of those boxes, and if they were just making it a bit grittier, this wouldn't even be a video. Edge it up! I love that shit! That's something I dig about Korra! Give me more violence in Avatar, please! 
I want bloodbending to look like Dead Man Wonderland. Bending can be terrifying. Lean into it. It's a war. Not that I want senseless violence, but a more mature take on The Last Airbender that's more in line with the themes and brutality we saw in Korra would be something that I think fans could appreciate. It justify this reboot existing beyond a three-year ploy to keep people subscribed to Netflix. But when you hear that they want the Game of Thrones audience, or that they change Aang fleeing from his responsibilities, having to alter why he ended up in the iceberg in the first place, that they reduced Katara's arc, and that they're toning down Sokka's arc because they don't want him to come across as an asshole? You know, before his development? I have to question why they chose to adapt the show in the first place. Now, the Game of Thrones comment isn't that egregious in isolation. You can see how someone would make that comparison when looking at elements like world building, the fact we're following different parties on their own journeys as their fates slowly intertwine, budding relationships and character dynamics that factor into major story beats. I feel like this isn't the craziest comparison, but mentioning Game of Thrones in the post-2019 world when trying to sell your reboot of a beloved property is a crazy move. And it feels obvious that Game of Thrones is brought up not because of any similarities in the two stories, but because they just don't want any potential viewers to be scared off by this being an adaptation of a kid show. It comes across as out of touch and completely missing the point of the example you're using and the show you're adapting. And again, Stranger Things is one of their biggest shows ever that everyone and their grandma tunes into whenever a new season drops. And no one is calling that a kid show, despite having humor and being greatly focused on a cast of kid characters whose actions are greatly influenced by the fact that they're kids. It just feels insincere. Another thing that has me concerned is the action, as it really makes me question what their vision is. They say that it's a remix, not a cover, yet one of the clips they use to promote the show is a one-to-one -one recreation of Aang vs. Boomy. I don't know, my guy. Looks like a cover to me. Despite making this fight shot by shot, it feels much less impressive, if not borderline corny, as the original takes advantage of its medium when Aang jumps over the boulder. In the cartoon, the changing perspective of the boulder is not not only appealing to watch as it creates a 3D illusion, but the angle and Aang's facial expressions helps convey that A, being able to dodge this boulder is a wild feat that not just anyone could pull off, and B, Aang still has a long way to go in controlling his airbending, the way he briefly holds his breath as he maneuvers around the attack. In the Netflix version, the angle doesn't really show how close the boulder was to Aang's body, and I don't know if it conveys that he is still using his airbending midair here, not just to lift off or the fact that he's still a bit rusty at doing so. It's easier to convey him holding his breath and breathing out in the cartoon. Here, his mouth is just open. I think it may look better on the TV without the one week away text, so we can actually see the full shot, as there's clearly a warping effect to try and capture what the cartoon accomplished. But for now, it just comes across as Aang doing a dramatic action movie backflip right out of the 2000s. You even got the slow motion. It feels corny. Not to mention, in the animated series, Boomy is shot by Aang's react time, but as a seasoned bender, he is still in control and is able to defend himself in an instant, reducing the boulder to Sand, something I don't think is ever done again in the series. It's clear earthbending is second nature to him. The Netflix version doesn't have as much impact. I don't know if it's because it takes three different shots to show Boomy tank the boulder, or because he doesn't seem as in control as he was in the cartoon, but it's why people are saying that this looks like a really good fan film rather than a multi-million dollar adaptation. Recreating highlights from the series without providing their own personal flair. It just feels safe and underwhelming. But hey, someone who's never seen the cartoon might love it. It's hard to judge this on its own merits when it's trying to imitate the original in moments where it should be able to do its own thing. There are different things that make action scenes excel in different mediums. But they released another clip today that showed Zuko and Iroh taking on some Earthbenders, and I don't think that looked bad at all. Which is why I'm going to hold out hope that this show could be, at the very least, decent. Because I don't think we can judge everything from clips alone, and I know there's been a fair share of good reviews. I'd love to see this show come out on top, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. As always, these are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. Does Avatar have any shot at being good, or is it already a wrap? Let us know in the comments down below, and keep the conversation going over on Twitter and Instagram at UltraClocks and at RoundtableVids. Check out Toon Drip for some dope cartoon-inspired merch, and if you enjoyed this video, please sort a like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys back here after the season drops. Peace!